Hello, everyone, and welcome to Columbia Business School Executive Education's Executive Webinar Series. Today, we're very excited to introduce the topic from innovations to innovative, innovation architects, and some other details to help your organization become more innovative. Now, before we begin, uh, I just have a few quick housekeeping rules uh, about the webinar. Just to keep in mind, a recording will be available after the webinar, so don't worry if you miss something, you will be receiving a link with uh, the full webinar for your reference. Uh, if you have any questions, after the session, there will be a brief Q&A uh, session that you could use the Q&A box on the bottom of your window there, and you can ask questions both during the session and uh, during the Q&A portion of the uh, webinar. Also, we encourage you to tweet about the webinar using the hashtag CBSExecEd and share all the learnings and uh, uh, materials that you've learned today. We're very excited to welcome our guest speaker today, who is Yoni Stern. Uh, Yoni is the partner in SIT, which is Systematic Inventive Thinking, and VP of Business Development for SIT's North American Business. He uh, frequently guest lectures around the world in universities and was formerly an adjunct assistant professor for the Columbia Business School MBA course on advertising, branding, and creativity. Yoni, it's a great privilege to have you here today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Nate. It's a privilege to be here. <clears throat> and I'm glad to meet uh, the anonymous uh, several hundred people who are attending this, uh, this webinar. Um, although I was uh, a former adjunct assistant professor uh, at uh, Columbia University. I'm still active uh, at Columbia University in the executive education business program, in the executive education programs. Um, I lecture both uh, on the innovation on demand online course and the design your innovation blueprint live uh, session. And um, I would be happy to meet any of you there uh, at either of those places. Uh, at sometime soon. So today's session, uh, as you saw, is about from innovations to innovative. <clears throat> um, organizations around the world have, in recent years, been creating these uh, these roles called innovation manager, VP innovation, chief innovation officer. Perhaps some of the people on the the webinar right now hold one of these titles, Director of Innovation, something of the sort. Raise your hand, uh, raise your hand on the webinar option uh, if you hold a title like this. Okay, the numbers keep rising. We're in the dozens now. Okay, <clears throat> so we have several people here. So you would know better than I would what your role and the definition of your roles are. Uh, I've been around the block a little bit in many organizations, so I have some, uh, some knowledge of the differences between the definitions of the roles in different organizations. Uh, if you're not an innovation manager, raise your hand if your company has an innovation manager role. Oh, those numbers are jumping even higher. Okay, so we all know what we're talking about. Uh, when we talk about innovation managers. Um, for the few who didn't raise their hand, uh, I did a very quick Google search, and the first uh, response that comes up for innovation manager defines the role as follows. An employee whose responsibilities focus on the development of new products, services, or processes. Um, you can blame it on SEO, or you can say that, yes, this is truly uh, a good definition. In my experience, it's the definition in many organizations um, that say that innovation managers are responsible for coming up with new products, services, or processes, uh, which in our language for today's webinar would be innovations. Uh, organizations are really interested in coming out with more and more innovations uh, and therefore, they've identified this necessity or the importance of having an innovation manager to ensure that new innovations are coming out. Now, sometimes those innovations may be through uh, mergers and acquisitions, uh, sometimes through partnerships, collaborations, et cetera. 
but they're always focused on the innovation itself. The same website in the second paragraph continues to say that another responsibility of innovation managers is to oversee innovation teams. Now, when I see the term innovation teams, uh, I know if, from my experience, two types of innovation teams that are in organizations. One are teams of people who are responsible for facilitating sessions in different business units in order to help the other the businesses within the organization become more innovative. The other definition of, in, of innovation teams that I'm uh, familiar with is that there's a team within the organization who's responsible for innovation. And once again, it's coming out with innovations that they're coming up with from within the organization. Um, the parallel that I like to use with this, uh, these innovation teams, is uh, has anyone, you can raise your hands again, has anyone been uh, worked in an advertising agency or worked closely with an ad advertising agencies as part of your roles? Okay, there, there are many dozens of you there. Um, so you're familiar that in most advertising agencies, there's a department called the creative department. <clears throat> They're the creatives of the organization. <clears throat> What we find when working with ad agencies that one of the biggest obstacles of becoming a creative agency is to have a creative department in an agency. It means that to the exclusion of everyone else in the agency, there are certain people in the organization that are supposed to be creative, and there are others who we have no expectations whatsoever of them really thinking creatively. The strategy people, the digital, they're not, they're not supposed to be thinking creatively. That's where the creative department Everyone else is just supposed to think regular. Um, we find that that's the same case in, with innovation teams of the second type within organizations, that once you've defined that you have an innovation team in your organization, it oftentimes prevents other people, the rest of the organization, to believe that they have a responsibility of being innovative. And therefore, if we go one step further, uh, I looked at Wikipedia, and Wikipedia doesn't have innovation manager, but it has innovation management. And I think that here we're coming to a closer definition of how do we transition from an innovations oriented company to an innovative company. Because here we're not talking only about products, services, and processes anymore. And we're not talking about only with one team. We're talking about innovation processes and change management. Change management is really important for everyone else in the organization who maybe aren't the innovation people. And that the idea of innovation management is to cooperate with a common understanding of processes and goals, that they respond to external or internal opportunities, that it's much more uh, prolific throughout the organization. And that's what we mean by from innovations to innovative. How do we make sure that the entire organization develops a culture and practice of innovation, of being more innovative as an organization rather than just having innovations coming out of the organization? One of these more important roles that we found along the way, um, we've somewhat even partially created it along the way, is what we call the role of the innovation architect. And an innovation architect, when you're looking to create an innovative organization, it means that you have to not only manage the innovations that are in the organization, but you also have to create a plan, a blueprint for how your organization is going to become more innovative. And what we find is that there are five main elements that are the responsibility of this plan or this mastermind of the program that will make the organization more innovative. The first one is innovation objectives. Second is innovation building blocks. The third is innovation resources. Fourth, an innovation plan. And fifth are the metrics of how to judge whether you're meeting your innovation plan and whether you're getting to your uh, innovative goals as an organization, is building the culture and practice. And so these are the five areas of skills and capabilities that an innovation architect needs to have in order to be uh, a, an expert at building this program, this building this plan for the organization. Uh, for the rest of this webinar, I'd like to just drill in a little bit to, to most of these areas um, to give a taste of 
what are the responsibilities, what are the things uh, that the innovation architect should take into account when building the, the uh, innovation plan for the organization to help it become more innovative. So the first one, when we talk about innovation objectives, the reason why we feel that it's really important to be aware of the innovation objectives is because when you move away from innovations, you have to understand that the purpose of innovation, we believe that innovation is a tool to help an organization become more agile, become more flexible, and to accomplish its, uh, its business strategy. And therefore, our working definition for innovation in this context is thinking and acting differently in a useful way. If you're willing to accept this as a definition of innovation, that something has to happen differently in somebody's mind, there has to be a cognitive change, it has to lead to some action taking place, and it has to be useful in that it's connected to the, uh, to the, organizational's, uh, the organization's strategy, then it's really important that we take into account the innovation objectives. What is the reason, the main reasons why this organization, why your organization is looking to become more innovative? What's the, how is it going to use innovation as a tool or as a capability in order to accomplish its business uh, objective or its social objective if it's a social oriented organization? So tweaking and defining how innovation is going to be used is really the, the backbone of how this innovation architect is going to build his or her plan, build the blueprint for the organization's uh, innovation program. The second element are innovation building blocks. And from our experience in working with uh, over a thousand organizations in 71 different countries, uh, we found that in order to be a truly innovative organization, the company has to take into account three main areas, and we call these the building blocks. And within each of these building blocks, there are a lot of specifics that have to be taken into account. These building blocks we call the three pillars of innovation. The first one is that any innovation program has to have elements of results. It can't just be a capabilities building uh, program. It has to make sure that built into the program that there are innovative results coming out. Now these results may be oriented externally as providing value for your customers, but just as much they could be oriented internally by making more efficient processes, by helping the organization uh, be more flexible, but that can be measured tangibly, that you can point to it and say, okay, this was a productivity uh, effort, and now we applied innovative thinking in order to come out with solutions around margin management that we normally hadn't thought of if we used our Six Sigma or our Lean methodologies or just run regular Kaizen's. So these results are a very important pillar to take into account when building your blueprint. The second building block are skills. If we truly want to become an innovative organization, we have to make sure that different people in the organization have different skill sets. We can't just depend on people's natural creativity or natural ability to change their habits because there are very few people who are naturally creative and almost no people who, are, who easily change their habits. And so we have to give different people different skills in order to make sure that they can contribute and be an important part of an innovative organization. And the third is structures, because if we're talking about being able to, to have this in the long term, to be self-sustaining for the long term and innovation, really become part of the culture of the organization, we have to manage it. And these structures help create the mechanisms to help the organization define when, or, when more innovative thinking will be used and when less. When to put different agents, innovative innovation agents onto a topic and when not. When is the right time to change business processes versus keep the business processes? How do we track innovations? How do we track the return on innovation? How do we track all these different, uh, different elements and measure how innovation is really contributing towards the success of the organization. So these are the three main building blocks that we find an innovation architect has to include within the innovation blueprint, the program that the innovation architect is building for the organization, is designing for the organization. 
Now, if we're talking about innovation agents, as I just mentioned, um, the next category, the third element to take into a, to account are who are the innovation agents in the organization? And we mentioned two of them so far. One is, yes, there's an innovation manager or innovation managers in many organizations. And that's a very important role within the organization to be able to manage the process. We started talking about the innovation architect and the innovation architect is a person who, before you even start managing the innovation within your organization or managing the culture and practice of innovation within the organization, that's the mastermind who plans it all. So the skills around planning versus managing are not always uh, overlapping within the same individual. Although oftentimes we do see that an innovation architect who builds a program eventually evolves into an innovation manager or one of the other innovation agents. So just to give uh, a taste of what are some of the different responsibilities of innovation agents within organizations, we find that innovation agents are, should initiate processes that are defined as needing innovation in order to help them become more valuable or more efficient. They direct innovation efforts, so they help choose and prioritize which, uh, which topics should be, uh, should be worked on, uh, what are the resources we want to devote and invest into different efforts, uh, build the cross-organizational bridges in order to help more collaboration and more sharing of information to break down silos, basically, within an organization uh, in order to help the entire organization on a much higher level. Deal with resistance. There's always going to be resistance to change and innovation necessarily because you're thinking and acting differently. It will result in change. So they help uh, deal with this resistance. They sometimes own ideas and help to make sure that they happen and to promote ideas that others own in order to help um, also with the communications across the organization. And they serve as an information hub. If you have the agents spread out across the entire organization, then by creating a community between them, which is an important element in creating an innovative organization, by creating an, a community between these different agents, then they, can, they, they become an information hub as to what is happening in other parts of the organization. Just to name a few of the more important innovation agents that we find are very helpful for an organization to become more innovative, uh, we have, as we mentioned, the innovation architect to plan. We have the innovation managers to really manage um, the, uh, the innovation that's happening throughout the organization and to manage the program and the process uh, as it goes on. We have innovation coaches, innovation advocates, we have executives, the top management also has to at least support uh, the program, if not to be heavily involved. A steering steering committee, implementation coaches, and I'll go into, uh, uh, I'll say a few more words about each of them um, in just a minute. So, as we said, the innovation architect, their main role is to build the innovation plan, taking into account all these different elements. Uh, when you take into account the innovation plan, as I mentioned, we have the three pillars. Uh, we see that there's an important progression of building your plan. You start with a proof of concept showing results. Otherwise, you get a lot of resistance. Then you move on to uh, structures in order to make sure that the organization is ready to accept the people that you're going to then go and train. If you train people without having enough structure, uh, under their feet, then they'll get lost and many of your uh, resources and efforts will go to waste until you have the right structure set up. And then eventually you go on to the sustaining and nurturing the innovation along the way. And once again, there are many different types of activities that fit into these different stages, uh, but this is the basic progression as we see uh, over time when the innovation architect is starting to think about his or her plan, their blueprint for the organization. 
Innovation coaches, sometimes called catalysts in some organizations, um, one of the most important skills that we see for innovation coaches or catalysts are to have the ability to tolerate ambiguity. Not even for them, not only for them to tolerate ambiguity, but to help others in the organization tolerate ambiguity because their role is to facilitate others in coming up with innovative ideas within their, the others, these participants, realms of uh, expertise or responsibility within the organization. Just to, to give uh, an example, one of the real responsibilities of these facilitators, the innovation coaches, is to make sure that, uh, that the, the people that they're working with break fixedness, break what's called cognitive fixedness. And through this following example, I'd just like to give an example of, of fixedness. Uh, many of you may have seen this already. This has been going around the internet for several years already. Uh, what you've seen in this picture is that there's a car. You might be able to see the, the car in the water. There's somebody standing in the water, in fact, um, on this car that, that parked too close to the edge and fell in the water. And now we have a crane, a crane on a truck, that's, that came to lift the car out of the water. Now, this crane is actually doing a pretty good job. That was a great idea to bring a crane. And the crane is starting to lift the car out of the water. But because it was parked in not the best angle, as the crane is trying to pull the car out of the water, you see that it itself falls into the water along the way. Now, we face a problem here because our crane solution apparently didn't work to pull the car out of the water. What would most people do in that case? And if you're thinking what you would do in that case, you might come to the conclusion that you should bring a bigger and stronger truck with a crane that can handle additional weight. And that's probably a really good idea. That's probably what I would try also. Now this crane actually succeeds very nicely in pulling the car out of the water, as it should have. And then its job is to pull out the original truck. However, because the original truck is heavier, this crane doesn't accomplish its job. And it too falls into the water. Now we're really faced with uh, crossroads. At this crossroads, we have to understand what are we going to do about it. Most organizations, and I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if your organization would do this, but most organizations would once again bring a bigger crane. This is what we call fixedness. Fixedness means that you have shortcuts, you have mental shortcuts on how to do your job properly based on your experience in the past. Most of the time, your experience is right and that you should trust your mental shortcuts and that's why you're an expert in that field and use your shortcut of bringing the crane to save the car, to pull the car out of the water. However, what we find happens is that when your first solution doesn't work, you try the same thing, just a bigger version of it or a more expensive version of it. And that's also reasonable. When it becomes a problem is when that backup option doesn't work and then you try the same thing over and over again. And that's what we call fixedness. When will they learn to not just bring heavier cranes, but also us in our own jobs, when will we learn that once you find that this direction of a solution isn't working for you, what can you do? And the idea of the innovation coaches, now we go back to the innovation coaches, is to help the participants break their fixedness. So when you use fixedness properly to create the shortcuts, that's great. When it's not working for you, the reason that we find it's not working is because you can't, it's very difficult for people to imagine viable alternatives to what they're doing today. And so the innovation coach is meant for the point when you realize that you have to uh, imagine new alternatives, viable alternatives, alternatives, um, that they're able to, to come ahead. They're able to help the group come up with those alternatives. Now, the next role 
to just introduce is what we call innovation advocates. Uh, sometimes we call them mother-in-laws uh, or mothers-in-law because they're the managers of the innovation coaches. They're the ones that can determine whether the coach is going to do his or her job or whether they're not. Because a coach is not a full-time job. A coach is somebody who sits within a department, within a team, within a business unit, and does their usual job, but also helps the rest of their team become more innovative, facilitate them in what the team needs. And if their direct manager, their day-to-day, -day, of their day-to-day -day work, is not supporting this, they can throw um, a lot of... Uh, uh, difficulties towards them and make sure that they become inactive. So there are the innovation advocates that also need to have some training. One, uh, one more role uh, is implementation coaches. And implementation coaches are the ones that make sure that things happen. They're the ones that can help you think innovatively about how to problem solve, whether it's a technical issue to get something to market or an organizational issue to get it through the organization, through the politics of the organization. And so implementation coaches have another skill set that's really important uh, in order to make sure that, it, that, in, that an organization becomes more innovative. And finally, the final role, just to mention, is what we call the steering committee. Sometimes we lovingly call it the stirring committee. It's representatives of each of these other uh, agent, each of these agents that come together as part of a committee on a quarterly basis and review the blueprint, review the metrics, make sure that the plan is on schedule, that the results are coming through, that the people who need skills are getting the skills, the people who have the skills are using the skills, that the structures are in place and that they're functioning. And they can recommend to the innovation architect that changes need to be made to the program based on the review of the last quarter. The reason why we call them the stirring committee is because sometimes things are just complacent. And one of their roles is not just to oversee the program, but they're also supposed to stir the pot. They're also to make sure that new things are happening all the time, that there's excitement, that there's buzz in the organization all the time around innovation. That's really how it becomes embedded within the culture of the organization. So I'd really be happy to meet several of you uh, or several hundreds of you uh, at the uh, Design Your Innovation Blueprint Exec Ed course, uh, where we'll dive deeper into these different agents, more specifically around these five different areas that innovation architects uh, need to gain proficiency in, in order to build the innovation blueprint for the organization. And, uh, and hopefully we'll get to meet in, per in person soon. I think now we're at the Q&A. Uh, we have uh, about five minutes left for a Q&A. So if anyone has questions, thoughts, comments, uh, please share. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Yoni, for sharing your thoughts on and expertise regarding innovation. I'm sure this has been very helpful for our listeners out there. And as Yoni mentioned, please uh, submit your questions to the, the box on the, the bottom bar of the screen there, Q&A. And it looks like we have a question from Dr. Diane Bradley. Uh, she asks, do you believe that the elements of innovation you have discussed are applicable to all industries? Um, actually, yes. Uh, we find that it that applies to all industries. Uh, we work with social, social sectors. We work with uh, municipalities, governmental organizations, um, for-profit across all industries and across cultures. It's not just a, an industry question. It's also a country question. Is it a domestic company? Is it a, a, a multinational? Is it a company that's only in India or in Brazil or wherever? We find that these are elements that are really important to take into account when building an innovation program. The differences we find are the details within these elements. So certain cultures will measure different things, will want to measure different things about their program. Some companies, some organizations, and some sectors might put more of an emphasis on one of the three pillars, results, skills, or structures, versus a different one. So that's really where the skill set of the innovation architect comes in. Uh, not just knowing about these five elements, but knowing how to, how to fine tune, or if you think about an equalizer, um, how to pull, the, pull and push the knobs 
in order to find the right calibration for that organization in that sector. Great. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we have another question coming in from Peter Zip. He asks, uh, innovation metrics are a nice idea, but how do you stop people from gaming the measurements? Oh, that's, that's an excellent question. Uh, the innovation metrics, I think, is, is one of the more complex uh, elements, and that's why we devote quite a bit of time to it in the uh, Design Your Innovation Blueprint uh, course. Um, and the reason why I didn't even introduce it here. Um, if you have the right structures, you can ensure that it's not one person gaming or a group of people gaming it. Uh, you can ensure that you're measuring different things that would validate uh, and make certain measures reliable. Um, so as long as you're measuring a good balance between inputs and outputs um, around uh, things that will lead to innovations versus things that, uh, that show that the process is working, so are we measuring process elements? Are we, work, are we measuring return? Uh, and at different stages that you're measuring different things and you have a little bit of redundancy in some of these measurements, you can come out with a more valid assessment uh, as to whether it's really working. But um, yeah, it's, it's not a simple thing to answer in, uh, in a short period of time. Uh, if you would like, uh, I'd be happy to correspond even with you uh, an email or to further follow up with this or by phone uh, around that uh, that discussion. Okay, great. Thank you, Yoni. Uh, I believe we have time for one more question. So uh, uh, the question here is, do you think that employees might have a greater incentive to innovate within their company if given an opportunity to jointly share in economic outcomes? <laughs> the short answer is no. Um, <laughs> I think I think that um, there are many different motivations. We have to find ways to incentivize people to to be active, but financial incentives are, based on the research, are the least effective. They're not ineffective, but they're the least effective of the different uh, ways to incentivize people uh, to become part of it, to become active in the innovation. Uh, I just recall. Uh, uh, an event about 15 years ago that I was part of um, where as when we were looking to, to help an organization build in a cross organizational innovation program uh, where I did a little bit of research to, to see what the role of innovation is within organizations and how it influences different elements within the organization and I was surprised to find 15 years ago but uh, now I, I've, I've witnessed it and experienced it on my, on my own flesh um, that the main uh, element in talent retention is allowing people to become innovative, both training them to do it and allowing them to do it and giving them the independence when they need to in order to think of new solutions and not shoot them down uh, and really take them into account and implement some of them. So. Uh, I find that the that other motivational elements are much more powerful uh, and that innovation can and should be used as a way to retain talent uh, and that there's a personal drive for people to be respected and for their minds to be respected and to be taken into account and for the organization to invest in them becoming better thinkers um, and uh, and people really appreciate that more than getting a financial uh, remuneration for their innovations. All right, well, I think that's all the time we have for today. I wanna say thank you again uh, to our speaker, Yoni Stern. Thank you so much for joining us. And for everyone out there, please uh, stay tuned, keep an eye on your inbox, and we look forward to joining you again in the future. Thanks again, Yoni. Bye-bye, everybody, thank you. <laughs>